There we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're just going to give everybody a couple seconds to filter in from the waiting room, but it's great to see you all here this afternoon. This is the Spring 2024 Kick Research Webinar. We have our speakers here today. All right. I think everybody has filtered in, so I'm going to officially kick us off. Okay, excellent. Um, so as I said, welcome to the Spring 2024 COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. My name is Lauren Close, and I am the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I am also a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. And so I'd like to take this moment to introduce you to the COVID Information Commons or to the KIC. Um, we are a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and founded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. KIC brings together scholars from all over the country and around the world to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. And today, each of our speakers will engage the community directly, answering your questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. I should also note that we at the KIC are committed to providing a supportive and welcoming environment to everyone who works, studies, interacts with the hub at all of our community events. So we encourage you to review our code of conduct for online programs. And this includes information about conduct reporting, accessibility features, things like that. I've just dropped a link to those research resources in the chat. And so this afternoon, I want to introduce you to um, two other members of the hub who are on our call today. Uh, we have Florence Hudson, our executive director, and Emily Rothenberg, who is our program manager for the National Student Data Corps or the NSDC. Um, but before we get to today's presentations, I also want to share a few brief announcements and info about the COVID Information Commons itself. Um, as I mentioned, the KIC is a project funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator and the NSF Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate. We are an open resource for researchers, students, and decision makers from across academia, government, not-for-profits, and industry. Main highlights of the KIC program include our searchable awards database, which you can see on our website, current listings of COVID publications and research opportunities. We also have research working groups for students, uh, translation programs, student paper challenges, um, and I'll leave more information about this to our executive director and PI, Florence Hudson, who will be giving a full presentation on the current state of the KICS program um, in a lightning talk actually later this uh, during this presentation. But all of this is to say that we have a very robust set of research and collaboration opportunities at the KIC. Um, for students, actually, who are looking to directly engage and apply their data science and research skills, one program I want to plug for you all is the KIC Annual Student Paper Challenge. This is a challenge that we recently launched that is up through the 31st of July. We're inviting higher ed and recently graduated students to complete scientific research and to synthesize those findings in a four to five page paper. Um, papers in the past have covered topics like pandemic recovering, health insights, future health innovations, and we expect more interesting papers in this coming submission period. We also host monthly mentoring sessions so participants can learn the best tips in completing a research project. The top three winners of the undergraduate community college cohort and the graduate cohort receive financial incentives. They may be invited to present their findings on a future webinar such as this one. So again, the submissions are due on the 31st of July. There's still time. We do accept projects that you may have worked on in the past. So go ahead and leverage that existing research. We hope you'll share this with your students. Okay, and one final set of announcements before we get to today's presentations. As I mentioned, we have two working groups for the COVID Info Commons. One is a student working group spearheaded by our work study students. The student working group has currently over 600 members from all around the world. This is a great and wonderful collaboration space for STEM students interested in working together on data science projects related to COVID-19. We currently have two data science projects for our students to engage in. One is a data visualization project, which helps students learn about data science and best practices for communication. 
The other uses the Oxford University Government Response Tracker data set to teach students how to identify time series and geospatial trends in global COVID policies. Students can participate in both challenges asynchronously and will receive a certificate for any projects that they complete. So more info is available on our website and I've just dropped some links into the chat. Then finally, I want to uh, highlight this new project that we've started this summer. We actually heard from our student working group members that they wanted more from us in the way of networking and growth opportunities. They specifically are looking for resources on how to take those certificates, which they earn from the data science projects to build out a digital portfolio, which showcases their proficiencies in STEM. So with their support, we've created a portfolio and network building group for students. Um, we currently host four types of PNB sessions throughout the year, which focus on peer networking, interview prep, resume reviews, professional communications, digital portfolio development tutorials, and more. The next meeting will be on Friday, June 28th, so please encourage your students to join us for this networking session. We currently have 70 students who plan to join us in late June, so it should make for a great conversation. But without further ado, I want to uh, stop chatting and I will instead introduce the speakers of today's KIC webinar. So today we will be hearing from three NSF and NIH funded researchers, one of whom is our own executive director at the Northeast Hub, Florence Hudson. So if you have any questions for our speakers during their presentations, please feel free to drop them into the chat or hold on to those questions for a Q&A session at the conclusion of all three presentations. Um, I will kick off this afternoon's webinar by introducing you first to Florence Hudson, again, our ED at the Northeast Hub, who will give our first presentation of the afternoon. Thank you, Lauren. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hey, dynamite. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. It's always wonderful to hear you listening and hear you asking questions. So uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat, as Lauren said. We like to do them at the end because sometimes a question will actually refer to multiple of the presentations. Um, so the COVID Information Commons started um, when COVID started, <laughs> pretty much. Um, the National Science Foundation contacted the Northeast Big Data Hub in March of 2020 and asked if we could create an open portal for people to easily find uh, NSF funded rapid awards. And those are the awards that the government gives out when there's a crisis. Uh, so NSF has rapids, I believe NIH has rapids. And so at the time uh, we went into the, the simple search of NSF and there were exactly 32 awards. I'll never forget this. And today we have over 13,000. <laughs> so, um, you know, none of us thought it would last this long and none of us thought it would get this big and it's just gonna keep going as we know. So we were really delighted to be able to help with this to create basically a fair portal to make research findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, and that's how the kick got started. Um, in our first, uh, after we, we got the award in March, it's a rapid award, so it's hurry up. Um, they contacted us in March, uh, contacted us in March, we got the money in May, and we launched our MVP in July. Um, so it was really very quick. And at the time, we invited two researchers to present um, in our kickoff webinar so that it wasn't just administrative, here's a portal. And 40 more researchers asked if they could present. We were like, whoa. So on our first call, we said, okay, welcome to the COVID Information Commons community. We'll keep presenting to each other and working together until we're done. And we're not done yet. Um, so we have, um, it's an open resource to explore research addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and the longitudinal impacts, as we know, which will be forever. And then um, you can search the COVID awards and PI or principal investigator database. We have a really cool machine learning map clustering tool we'll show you. Um, and the initial 2020 award was then expanded with an extension award um, in 2021, which goes um, through October of 2025. And uh, we'll see if uh, they still want us to keep doing this. We'll see. But we actually are archiving in Dryad, for those of you who are familiar with Dryad, so it has longitudinal um, life. Next slide, please. And as Lauren said, it was launched by the Convergence Accelerator, which is now the TIP Director at Technology Innovation and Partnerships NSF, and we're very grateful for their support. 
So the kick community started from nothing in 2020, just like everything COVID related or COVID-19 related. Um, and the community has actually grown to over 3,600 individuals and, and over 800 organizations across the U.S. and 37 other countries. And in this past year, uh, we had a 25 increase, a 25 percent increase um, year over year. And I think a lot of that has to do with the great work Lauren has done. <laughs> I shouldn't talk too much about this, but she started the COVID Info Commons Researcher Working Group, the Student Working Group. Um, there are these, these very interesting data visualization and data science projects students can do, and it really has grown um, the community a lot. And the good news is that even though COVID-19 is not a wonderful thing to be living through or have lived through, now the students are getting more involved in understanding what did we learn from the data? How do we leverage the data? So what we're hoping and praying is that in the future, when they get to worry about this, when there is a COVID or whatever comes next, you know, that they will have some skills and tools that will enable them to help us since they're going to be our future. Um, so the community has continues to grow. Next slide, please. So um, when, you know, we were working with NSF, you know, after we first started, we said we're very grateful, you know, for the support and the funding, but this is a disease. So we really feel like we should be working with NIH as well. And they were like, that's a good point. So uh, that's when they asked us, you know, if we would expand the kick. Um, so we got this kick extension award and they gave us another $2 million for four years. And since then, that's when we went from like 32 to 732 NSF awards, and now over 13,000 NSF and NIH awards that are in the corpus, and we update it monthly. So this is a view if you were to go in on our main web page, and you could see where it was that, you know, search the COVID awards and PI database, you would go in here, you could put someone's name in there, or you could put, you know, epidemiology or bats or whatever. We have actually had presentations on bats. So um, this has a lot of awards in it. There's information on the researchers. You can, on the end, from the NSF ones, you can click through directly to their, um, their, uh, their award on the NSF website. With NIH, it brings you to the reporter tool and then you get to put the information in. And there are also uh, PI profiles for some of the principal investigators who choose to fill that in. And as you can see, there's a faceted search. So you can, um, you can search by funder, which is NSF or NIH. You can search by organization, a bunch of other things. This is the machine learning maps tool. Um, this is powered by Lingo4G from Carrot Search in Poland. And they actually take the 13,000 awards and then cluster them by topics. So it gives you a nice colorful view and allows you to find people that might be doing research in your area of interest or the interest that you're actually researching. It allows you to look by funder. It allows you to look by the institution that got the money. It allows you to look by PI name so that you can find the humans and the institutions you can collaborate with in your topic of interest. Next slide, please. And so after the machine learning maps tool, uh, I just wanted to share about some of the other research uh, resources we have. We have over 80 open source COVID-19 data sets. Lauren just did a scan to make sure that they haven't been archived. We had, have had some data sets archived, as you can imagine, related to COVID, but we try to keep an eye on that. So we just you know, took another scan through it this week. Um, we have a listing of publications, research groups and guides, um, and then research funding listings. There are still some funding resources as we look at long COVID and and uh, SARS-CoV-3, as we're going to hear about. Next slide, please. We do these quarterly webinars. We started out with monthly, and we gave people like five to seven minutes because they hadn't done any research yet, you know, in 2020, but they wanted to talk about it to find each other. Um, so now we're, we're quarterly, and then we say like, you know, 10 to 12 minutes because you actually have done the research, so we get to learn from each other. We've had over 130 individual presentations to date from NSF, NIH, and CDC researchers. Um, and if you know of any researchers that have been funded by these government agencies, please let us know or have them contact us, and we'd be happy to have them present on a future webinar. Next slide, please. So we also have a Meet the Researchers tab on the website, so you can browse the 130 plus research lightning talks. Um, and Lauren has actually categorized them as you can see COVID in biology, COVID in data. So if you wanted to subset them more easily, we also have the presentations, not just the video, but Lauren and the student team that we have have actually transcribed them into written English, not just the the quasi, you know, trans translations or transcriptions that are done on the internet, but the team has actually vetted each one. And then we actually have students that have translated them into Spanish and French, and we're going to be um, translating them into Hindi as well, which increases accessibility for people who may have 
may think in one language, learn in another language, speak in a different language. So we really try to make it as accessible. The Meet the Researchers includes the PIs, such as on the, on the call with us today, NSF, NIH, CDC, but also the students who win the paper challenges. So the first one that you see on this screen, Aditya Kulkarni, um, he actually was one of the winners of the student paper challenge the first year that we had it. And so he was able to present on, on, a, on a webinar like this, and we have his material. All of these are actually also uploaded into the Columbia Academic Commons, so they get a digital object identifier, a DOI, for posterity um, with the researcher's permission. Next slide, please. So we really do try to make this very fair, you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We put all of this on YouTube, um, so the videos, and we have little research spotlights, which, which gives people a little test, a taste of, you know, how did COVID impact science education, and then bring you to the video on that. Um, once again, with these transcriptions and translations, and it's a fun little, like, less than one, one minute way to see what's going on, and then click into a video that you might be interested in. Next slide, please. And then an exciting thing is I actually um, publish with Springer, um, and I've done a couple of books with them, Springer Nature, you may be familiar with them. And the books I've previously done were on a new standard that was just approved by IEEE <laughs> this past week um, on security and privacy called TIPS uh, for Clinical Internet of Things. But we're doing a new book with them, which is going to be um, with the, the speakers, uh, the PIs who've presented on these researcher lightning talks, who are NSF or NIH funded researchers. And they're going to be writing chapters that talk about, you know, what was um, what was the title of your project? Who is the funder? What was the goal of your research? What were the outcomes? And therefore, what are your recommendations regarding mitigation of future pandemics? And the reason we're doing this is because when we when NSF first contacted us and said, we want you to write this, you know, create this portal so people could find COVID research, I went looking for COVID research because the coronavirus has been around for decades and it was very hard to find anything. And so I feel like it's our duty <laughs> to document this better so that people can actually find what we've learned and not have to start from scratch. So we're excited about this. They're writing their chapters. I just got the second version of one of the chapters today, um, and they'll be writing them this year, and we plan to publish the beginning of next year. So we're excited that Springer Nature is supporting this, and NSF is totally on board with it, which we're grateful for. And then we're able to give all these, uh, these PIs and these authors a voice. You could see there are about 30 chapters and about 100 authors. We really encourage them you know, to have all their researchers involved if they want their students involved. I love giving a voice to all of these researchers. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing. So we're looking forward to that coming out and you'll all find out about it when it gets published. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning and Lauren briefly mentioned, uh, we have a Kick Research Working Group if you'd like to join. Um, we've been talking about maybe doing a long COVID uh, piece of research. We haven't really kicked it off yet. If you have any ideas on joint research you would like to do, please let us know. And um, you, know, you can join us. That's always on our homepage. Next slide, please. And then we have the student working group, which has really grown. Um, and we're really excited that students really want to learn how to get information out of this data and knowledge and insight for the future, for today and the future. And we have over 600 members from 230 organizations across the U.S. and six other countries. Um, they can we um, participate in the projects that have already been um, have already finished from the last two semesters. These projects are available on our data science projects page on the hub, as well as through the KIC website on data visualization, analyzing pandemic policy project. They can use data sets from the COVID Info Commons, the analyzing pandemic policy project um, that. That one actually uses um, a University of Oxford database, very interesting. So we always use open data sets so anybody on the planet can leverage them. And there'll be a new project in the fall. Um, Lauren mentioned the Portfolio and Network Building Group, which is a really cool opportunity for students to meet each other. Um, it could be that they can help each other think through their research. It could be they meet a student at a college that they're planning to do their master's at, you know, whatever it is, so that we can collaborate together. We As the Big Data Innovation Hub, our job is to be a collaboration hub and a catalyst for innovation. And so this really helps us do that with the students leveraging each other's content and knowledge, which is really exciting. So please invite any of your students, um, peer networking session. The next one will be June 28th. Next slide, please. 
Lauren mentioned the Kick Student Paper Challenge that occurs annually. Um, and so the final submissions are due July 31st. They can just go to the website. You can see a bit.ly here, 2024-kick-spc for Student Paper Challenge. They can um, enroll in that and then they'll get reminders submit the paper, and then we actually have incentives we were able to bake into the grant. Um, so I think the first place is like $400. You know, if it's a team, they share it. Um, and then second and third place. And we have that for the undergraduate community college cohort, as well as graduate. It's global. Uh, one of our winners was actually from South Africa. And uh, she actually was invited to speak at the Academic Data Science Alliance Conference in Texas this past year, which she was able to attend. So it's a wonderful professional development opportunity for students. So please encourage them to participate. Next slide, please. And actually, you can be a judge or a mentor, too. You can go to the website and sign up to be a judge or a mentor. So we're very interested in always making our content as accessible as possible. So as I was mentioning, it's available on YouTube. Um, there are translations done. And then we also put the, the information on the Columbia Academic Commons. If you know of any students or anyone that might be interested in translating into another language <laughs> or the languages that we currently serve, please, please let, let us know. We have this real program at the Hub, you know, research experience and leadership opportunities. And we love when the, when the whole community participates. Next slide, please. So that's it. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of the kick. This is you know, you're all part of my family now. Um, and so stay in the loop for upcoming events. You can join our mailing list. We send out a monthly newsletter. And if there's anything else uh, we can do, we'd love to know. Thank you, Lauren. No, thank you, Florence. It's um, great to be part of the KIC program and uh, to work on all these exciting projects. It's, it's nice to be able to share them with anybody, you know, with the entire rest of the room here. Um, for everyone else who's in the audience, note that if you have any questions for Florence, I see a handful already. Go ahead and drop those into the chat. You can also hang on to them because we'll be hosting a Q&A session after all the presentations uh, so we can talk together about them. Um, but for now, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Elena Solo Gabriel, who is a professor at the University of Miami. It's actually the second time we've had her speak at a KIC webinar, so we're very excited for this research update on wastewater monitoring. Thank you so much. And thank you for the second opportunity. The first time was very early on in our project, and in, this is sort of a follow-up. So uh, to talk about what we've accomplished um, in, in throughout the duration of the project. I'm gonna speak about our project called SF or South Florida RAD. It's a wastewater based epidemiology program. And we receive funding through the NIH RADx Radical Program, RADx Up Program, and through Floor Catalyzer. Uh, our goal, our aims are to develop a data standardization platform by which we can combine human surveillance data along with wastewater put that together so that we can then characterize outbreaks and predict them. And our hope is that this information will be used for policymaking decisions. This is a joint project between University of Miami and Wild Cornell Medicine. I serve as the PI on the project. I'm Helena Solo Gabriel and um, Stefan Schur as well, and Chris Mason. Helena, do you have slides that you wanna share? Oh, I am so sorry. I thought I was sharing. I apologize. Let me go ahead and share my slides. Let's make sure I've got the right slide. Do you see my slides here My in presentation mode? You saw them for, I think, a brief moment. OK, let me try again. But it was working before everybody else joined, so we know it works. There, there we go. Great. You see it now? Yes. OK, great. Okay, so um, yes, I just presented on this slide, so I will continue on. And I wanted to start with our acknowledgements. Um, this pr project was a huge team effort all the way from the president of the university, including faculty, staff, and students. I also wanted to acknowledge the many de departments and units of the University of Miami, including CIFAR, Center for AIDS Research, which is also part of the University of Miami, while Cornell Medicine and also Medisub. Our sample um, analysis plan was designed to split the sample into three splits. One was sent to Center for AIDS Research where it was analyzed by Dr. Mark Sharkey using a new innovative technology called Volcano Second Generation PCR 
That was our backbone for our rapid response. We were able to turn around samples within 12 hours. We also sent samples to the Oncogenomics Shared Resource where they were analyzed by RTQPCR for comparative purposes. Also at the Oncogenomics Shared Resource, we had the samples analyzed for um, variants using a, a deep targeted sequencing approach. Samples were also sent to Wild Cornell Medicine where they were analyzed by metatranscriptomics using RNA-seq and all the bioinformatics were done through Wall Cornell Medicine. All of our sample collection plans were mapped to human surveillance programs. Um, at the University of Miami, we had an extensive testing, tracking, and tracing program of our students and faculty and staff. We also at the University Hospital had access to electronic medical records. We also had access to zip code level data through the Florida Department of Health, and through Miami-Dade County Public Schools, we had information on absenteeism. When it came to the pandemic, the most extreme as aspect of the pandemic were the lockdowns, which were motivated by the hospitals getting overwhelmed. We know that from the wastewater, we the hospitalizations can be predicted from the wastewater. Here we have a black line corresponding to the hospitalizations, the green corresponding to the wastewater numbers. What we found throughout the pandemic is that early during the pandemic, a small amount in the wastewater represented a lot of hospitalizations. But as we were going through the various phases of the pandemic, the slope flattened so that now we're still seeing it in the wastewater, but it's not resulting in as many hospitalizations. So flattening of the slope. In terms of the variants, um, on the right, we see the colors showing the different variants in both the clinical samples and the wastewater samples. They were both tracking each other. So from the wastewater, we can also see the variants. On the left-hand side, we see the relative timing of the variants observed in the wastewater versus the clinical samples. And we see that for the Delta variant, for example, we saw it in the wastewater one week or seven days prior to seeing it in the clinical samples. In terms of the hospital data, uh, we also were able to evaluate comorbidities, and we were able to observe correlations between the hospital wastewater SARS-CoV-2 numbers and the number of patients, and also early during the pandemic with remdesivir administration. Also from the hospital wastewater, we were able to observe monkeypox, the virus in the wastewater, and we were able to compare that to the number of patients in the hospital, and it coincided in time. Similarly, for candida auris, the fungal pathogens, we were able to correlate the presence of candida auris in the wastewater with the presence of candida auris patients in the hospital. Now, for candida auris, not only were we able to see this fungal pathogen molecularly, we were also able to culture it as well. So our next steps are really focusing on additional targets. Uh, we've teamed up with um, another group at Yale University. We've downloaded data from Wastewater Scan, from Biobot. All of these different laboratories are analyzing for SARS-CoV-2. Just to give an update as to where they all stand, um, this is positivity or positive cases um, in Miami-Dade County. And you can see that the number of cases are decreasing over time because of people are not going to get tested. But if we divide by the number of tests, so the percentage that are positive amongst those who are tested, we're still seeing significant positivity. Um, and it's remaining pretty consistent over time. And if we compare that to the wastewater from all the different labs. Again, we see the correlation with the Delta wave during the Omicron wave between the wastewater and the positivity, and also during the post-Omicron waves. And we're seeing consistency across all the different labs. In addition from the shotgun sequencing, as you can see on the green to the right, um, what's fascinating about the sequencing is now we can see abundances of pathogens directly. In the past, um, typically you couldn't get to the pathogen level, but the green shows the bacterial pathogens that are being observed in the wastewater from sequencing. And then also from the RNA sequencing, we can even see viral pathogens, um, inclusive of norovirus and Aichi virus. In addition to that, we can see antimicrobial resistance genes. Um, we found that they were significantly higher, more diverse in the hospital wastewater compared to the wastewater treatment plant. And as you go downstream the, through the sewer system, we're seeing lower levels and less diversity. We've also teamed up with a group called um, 
phase genomics. And phase genomics has a very unique technology where they can provide host attribution to AMR genes. And so, for example, for the host of the bacterial host of Provitella, there's two antimicrobial genes that are shown by the blue stripes here. And those two AMR genes are found in the genomic um, structure of the bacteria. So our next steps are focusing on targets beyond SARS-CoV-2, and we're looking at air and surface sampling as well as wastewater. We're very excited about the sequencing and the target agnostic analysis provided by sequencing. The big challenge is how do we interpret all of this information that we're getting from wastewater, um, getting the clinical data to match up to the wastewater so we can we know what it all means um, is uh, one of the challenges in, in putting this information together. And then, of course, data assimilation, trying to put the wastewater data with the human health data automatically so that reports can be generated in a faster fashion. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, my email is here if you have any questions. And we have our publications um, shown here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us again. This is a really interesting update, I would say, on the presentation we heard from you. It was in 2021, maybe. Um, but it's, it's great to get some additional updates. Thank you so much. I want to now um, introduce our final speaker of the day, um, Dr. Xiaowang Tang, who's at Bowling Green State University, and Dr. Tan will share his research on DNA aptameters and the future of COVID-19. Okay, excuse me, one minute, let me share the screen. So, can all of you see my screen? Yes. Sars cov three. Yes. Oh, okay. All right, so first, thanks to invite me here, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to show my research work to the publics. So today I'm going to give a talk about the SARS-CoV-3. So my name is Xiao Hong Tan, you can call me XT. I came from uh, Bowling Green, Ohio. So before we touch the talking about the SARS-CoV-3, let's just briefly introduce or just briefly touch the world wars. Everyone knows World War One, World War Two, and uh, when we will have the World War Three, no one wanted. It. And as a bi biochemist, my lab probably can do nothing for the World War Three, but my lab can do some work for the SARS-CoV-3. So. In the past 20 years, we already have three outbreaks of the beta coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is still here. So imagine in the past 20 years, we already have three. So this is highly possible for the next uh, beta coronavirus, for example, SARS-CoV-3. It might come in the next decade. So we still remember how bad it was when SARS-CoV-2 came here. It killed so many people, right? We get isolated. So it is extremely important if we can have some tools to, to fight for the SARS-CoV-3 in advance, then we can save a lot of lives. So that's the purpose for my talk today. How can we design a tool for the SARS-CoV-3 in advance? So what could be SARS-CoV-3? If we look at the coronavirus family tree, I put the future putative SARS-CoV-3 just after the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So I have to highlight for the past, the COVID-1, COVID-2, and the mers -CoV, all of them belong to the beta coronavirus. This is a spike protein for the beta coronavirus. So here is a Delta and Omicron for the SARS-CoV-2. It contains two domains, S1 domain, S2 domain. So you can see S1 domain contains a lot of the mutations indicated by these uh, color dots. If you look at S2 domain, it's highly conserved. So if you compare the S2 domain of the past three beta coronavirus, you can see among three of them, the S2 domain, amino acid sequence highly conserved, and the structure no change. Therefore, I hypothesis 
if we have the SARS-CoV-3, it is highly possible, okay, we will have a SARS-CoV-3. The S2 domain, still no change. So that means we can target on this highly conserved S2 domain to find the, the chemical ligand to fight for the future SARS-CoV-3. So many labs or, or, or industry, academia labs, we design the tools to bind into a spike protein, uh, for example, antibodies. And another one can bind into a spike protein, prevent it from binding the human receptor. In my lab, we design uh, DNA-based aptamers to bind into a spike protein. So what is aptamers? Aptamers is single-stranded oligonucleotides. It's a single-stranded DNA, or RNA. RNA is single-strand. They can form to the complex 3D structures and enable them to recognize different targets. So compared with the antibodies, aptamers have many advantages. And one significant advantage is a DNA aptamer is very low cost. So compared with antibody, it could be 2,000 times cheaper. So if we can have such low-cost tools combined into the spike protein, we can have a very useful tool. So as I said before, we want to target in a highly conserved S2 domain to find into the DNA aptamers. So let me briefly touch this S1 domain. Spike protein has S1 and S2 domain, two domains. We're targeting highly conserved S2 domain, and S1 domain containing a very famous receptor binding domain called RBD. This part is the spike protein, is how the virus using the spike protein to recognize the human receptors. Of course, this is the most popular target, but you cannot use this one as a universe target because among, even among SARS-CoV-2, Delta, Omicron, S1 domain is highly mutated, okay? So we target in a highly conserved S2 domain. So we use a optimal selection approach and we finally obtain a single strand DNA. So this is the structure and the sequence. We measure the binding affinity determined to be a low nanomolar range. So this is a very good binding affinity. So how about the binding specificity? So we use a color metric RC. So in this RC, you can see if you add the target protein, the color will change to the purple. If without the target protein, for example, non-specific proteins, the color is still red. So if we add the S2 protein, this is our selection target, of course, change the color. If you add the whole spike protein, it continues S1 domain, S2 domain of the SARS-CoV-2, it's changing color. If you add the SARS-CoV-1 spike protein, it also changed color. It was not a surprise to us because as I said before, S2 domain is conserved. So for the SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, they have a very similar S2 domain. So my aptamer can recognize all of them. If you test all the non-specific background proteins, you can see the color still red, especially for the S1 domain, for the SARS-CoV-2. So this data clearly shows us we have a higher uh, uh, affinity binders, which can specifically recognize the S2 domain of different beta coronavirus. So next, we check the inhibition RC. This is ELISA RC. So briefly speaking, if you code the human receptor here, if you add a spike protein in the substrate, you will see the color. If you add inhibitors, prevent the spike protein binding to the human receptor, you can see weak or no uh, color, uh, colorful intensity. So if we assume that the no aptamers as the 100%, we test the negative random aptamer sequence. You can see there's no inhibition. So we test the positive control. This is uh, uh, reporting the DNA aptamer. They know this one can bind into the S1 domain, and we target it to the uh, Y type SARS-CoV-2 here, and it can block more than close to 70%. So how about our aptamers? It looks very similar. It also can block the spike protein to recognize the human ACE receptor. This actually was a surprising data to us because I said before, my aptamer binding to S2 domain. And it is well known the spike protein used S1 domain to bind into the human cells. So why you bind into S2 domain 
can affect the S1 membrane to the human cells. So here is a hypothesis. Based on the structured data, we know that if the spike protein needed to bind into the ACE2 receptor, one S receptor binding domain needed to open. So our hypothesis is that once S2 binding here, S2 domain, the after binding to S2 to M2 domain, it might have a losterity effect to prevent this S1 domain to open. So that's hypothesis. But unfortunately, we work very hard with our collaborators try to use the crime EM solvent structure, but the nucleic acid the protein complex structure is very difficult to be resolved. One partial reason is because aptamer is a single strand nucleotide. They are highly flexible. So we don't have the structured data so far, but this is our hypothesis. So the conclusion is that we report the first anti-S2 aptamer. So it has a received binding to an independent approach to inhibit the virus using a spike protein recognized in human cells. And because S2 domain is highly conserved, so we believe now we have a tool in advance to fight for the SARS-CoV-3. So maybe in the next decades, when the SARS-CoV-3 come here, we have this aptamer, which can be designed as a bioidentic tool or use a therapeutic tool to fight for the future purity of SARS-CoV-3. So by the way, I have to mention that we reported the first anti-S2 abdomen and afterwards people reported uh, the anti-S2 antibody. They observed that using the anti-S2 antibody, it can also block the virus to infect human cells. But I have to see our abdomens is 2,000 times cheaper than antibodies. So take this opportunity, I'd like to thank uh, the NSF and the BGSU to provide me the support. And uh, thanks to the tank group, and especially the Dr. Archu Siva. Uh, he finished most of this work. And right now, Archu right now is in the University of Columbia to perform his second postdoc. And thanks to my collaborators, uh, Saurabh and Bean, for the virus support and for the structures and analysis. And thank you so much, too. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Um, it's very interesting to start already thinking about the next pandemic. It's uh, hard. This one has been hard enough, but you're you're right to keep us on our toes. And I'm going to briefly share um, for all of us as we wrap up the presentations for today. Um, I want to thank, of course, all of our speakers for sharing their research. And before I hand the mic back over to Florence to uh, oversee the Q&A session of today's webinar. I also want to briefly plug all the different ways that you can stay in touch with the kick in between these, um, you know, seasonal webinars. So you can obviously check out our website, please subscribe to our newsletter, but you can also follow us on X, on Instagram, on Slack, um, LinkedIn, all of the places. Um, if you have specific questions for us, you can always email us directly. And I will, of course, share all of these links in the chat so you can peruse our channels at your own pace. Do keep an eye out for communications from us about our upcoming events and activities. Now that I've done this kind of admin work on the back end, I will open it up to more Q&A from our audience. Um, and I'll hand it over to Florence to go through the questions, which are already a few in the chat. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lauren, as always, for organizing all this. And thank you to the speakers, Helena and Dr. Tan or XT. Thank you for your gracious way for us to uh, refer to you. Um, and so one of the questions what in here was, how long did the project take you, Dr. Tan? Um, you know, with all this great work that you did in the analysis, how, many, how long were you working on this? Oh, we in, in our lab, we take uh, this project, we take like two to three years to finish it. We are still working on it. <laughs> and then when SARS yeah when SARS CoV three comes along then you'll have new data I hate to say it but right I don't want it to come here but in the past twenty years we already have three so who knows it's highly possible it will come here yeah it is and and that's really you know why we continue working together is to figure out what have we learned and yeah. how leverage that for the future right um, and so I think it's very helpful to do that. Um, and then another point, you know, Jeffrey Henderson, thank you for mentioning the uh, COVPN Coordinating Center at Fred Hutch. Um, so we, um, I think you mentioned that um, 
They work with UW, University of Washington. So we have a relationship with the CORD-19 folks at UW, not with the COVPN crowd yet. And there's actually a COVPN at UC San Diego and we work with them too. <laughs> so I think a lot of people wanna to try to uh, coordinate with this. So thank you for mentioning them. We'll look at their website and maybe we'll add it to the KIC website. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Lauren and I will take, take note of that and, uh, and see if we can add that to our website if they still have an ongoing um, ongoing work uh, there. Uh, do you work with them already, Jeffrey? Or you just know about it? Yes, hello everyone. <clears throat> um, I'm a clinical trialist here in Rapid City, South Dakota. And the Novavax phase three COVID-19 uh, vaccine trial was funded through the COVID Prevention Network, uh, funded both by NIH and Novavax. Um, and we conducted this on my Shine River Sioux Tribe reservation uh, in uh, north, northern South Dakota. Um, and our trial site was established with the COVID Prevention Network. We are site number 130. Um, and it's a public-private uh, consortium that was started under Operation Warp Speed under the prior administration. And both Moderna and Pfizer's inaugural COVID-19 booster vaccine trials were established under the COVID Prevention Network. Um, uh, and um, it, is, it is still active. Dr. Lawrence Corey is the PI. And um, we, uh, we at our trial site, once we finished with the Novavax phase three trial, we've done four more clinical trials, but outside the COVID prevention network umbrella. Uh, two with Sanofi, the giant French pharma for COVID-19, uh, both the initial placebo controlled vaccine trial, as well as their COVID-19 booster vaccine trial. And um, we also have conducted two trials with Moderna and their mRNA platform, uh, one for influenza and the other for RSV in older adults. Um, Very interesting. Thank that's you. That's a little bit about the COVID prevention network with which I'm uh, a part of. It was very enlightening. Thank you very much for sharing your insight and experience. I, I really wasn't aware of that. And actually, now I have another question. So um, you were talking about clinical trials. And um, something I, I may briefly mention at the beginning is that we work on um, standards related to security and privacy. And um, I lead a global working group uh, with IEEE the Institute for Electronic Engineers, and they just approved our standard for clinical Internet of Things, data and device interoperability with TIPS, which means trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security. And we're actually having a series of webinars. And the next one is going to be taking this TIPS framework under the clinical Internet of Things umbrella and talking about the privacy and security needs in decentralized clinical trials. So that sounds like something your heart and your mind might be interested in. <laughs> Well, yes. Um, you know, our trial site is called the American Indian Clinical Trials Research Network, uh, and 90 plus percent of our trial vaccine trial participants are American Indian tribal members, members mostly of the Rapid City Indian community, but also coming off uh, each of the three large Lakota Sioux reservations here in western South Dakota. And Yes, I certainly have uh, an interest in and opinions about some of these decentralized features of these clinical trials we've been conducting. They can prove very challenging um, and can prove to be quite an obstacle uh, for quite a few of our uh, trial participants. Um, and there's reasons for that, of course, and uh, there's changes we're making in recruitment and community outreach, uh, you know, there's things we can do on our part as well uh, to mitigate uh, that impacts uh, on them. Uh, and for the Internet of Things, uh, we have a brand new trial we're starting, which features the Emerald Sleep Sensor. 
to be placed in our trial participants' homes, mounted on a wall on the side of, on the wall in their bedroom, on the side of the bed that they sleep, which um, is very interesting. And um, one can only imagine the types of data, you know, that are going to be generated by that. It's supposed to link to mobility uh, and sleep soundness is its main things that it will be capturing while it's resident in participants' homes for 20 or so weeks. Uh, but, uh, you know, but certainly that sounds like it's very much right there in just what you described. Yeah, and so um, you have to excuse me. I actually have COVID right now, which is why I'm coughing. But anyway, um, so Lauren put a link in the chat um, for the tips webinars. So if you want to go to that, you could sign up for these decentralized clinical trials one, which is June 18th. Ooh, it's a week from today. Um, and then we could add you to the list of people who are interested. Um and I'd love to hear what you think about it. You know, feel free to keep in touch. You guys can find me anywhere on the Hub website, or you can send an email to, um, what's our standard uh, contact at nebdatahub.org, Lauren? Oh, I can share um, info at covidinfocommons.net is the best way to reach us through the regular kick umbrella. However, if you want to reach out to us through our sister program, which is um, the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, there's a different email for that, which is contact. Yeah. Okay, great. So any of those, and then we'll, we'll all see it, Emily and Lauren and I, we're the whole team. <laughs> so uh, it's great to find somebody that has your, your depth of interest and knowledge in this space, because when we go into these like uh, standards bearing era, you know, projects, we want to make sure that people have like feet on the ground and understand, not just create a theoretical plan, right? So when we did the clinical Internet of Things initial standard, which was just approved uh, by IEEE, um, I was leading it because I care and I do. I've been doing Internet of Things strategy for years, but we had um, a co-vice chair from Medtronic, a co-vice chair from Indiana University Health their chief information security officer. And then our, our secretary was from Drager Medical. So we like people that are definitely in the zone as we develop these standards initiatives so that it makes, so it's practical. So we would love you to participate, you know, listen in, and even we're going to be probably kicking off a working group if you know anybody that'd like to be involved. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was great. Okay. Um, let's see. Those were the questions I'd seen so far. Um, and I think you had another question here, Lauren, is how we might apply these research principles to other coronaviruses or other viruses in particular. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, is there related or complementary research you're doing, Dr. Tan, with this approach that you're using for SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-3? Yeah, we also consider the use of this one for other virus. So it is uh, time consuming to figure out where is the conserved domain for different virus, you know, because SARS-CoV-2 is quite different. So many people study in this field, we have so many different information, but uh, theoretically, the strategy targeting the conserved domain can be applied for different virus. Very good. Well, we love when, um, that's one of the things that we love about bringing researchers together and even all by yourself, you know, you can actually look at how else might we, might we apply this. There's another project I'll just mention briefly that we're involved in at the Northeast Big Data Hub. You know, the COVID Infocoms is one of our big projects. Another one is something called the Prototype Open Knowledge Network or OKN. And we're working with um, 18 total different grants funded by NSF to actually create an interoperable knowledge graph infrastructure to share data across research domains. Very interesting. And you might think, why would we want to share data across environment, health, criminal justice, technology and manufacturing? But that's part of the idea is, you know, or is there data we're using or are there processes that we are using that could help us solve another challenge that we have, another societal challenge? So this proto-OKN project, which might be interesting and um, we can actually put that in here. <laughs> I'm sure Lauren will fake. Lauren actually created the website so she can put it in here for you. 
she's the creator. Um, and you can look at those projects that are going on now. And um, if you keep an eye on that website that we have, which is just protookn.net, um, then you can actually see what we're doing. And if you go there now, you'll see that there are like UCSF is involved, UC San Francisco, a lot of different universities, companies, where we're looking to create this network of knowledge graphs with an integrated interoperability fabric. So it's very interesting. We'll see what we end up with from this, but um, it's another opportunity for collaborative research, which we really, we love doing and we like to be a leader in that. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, this looks very interesting for me. I thought you'd like it. Yeah. Good. Um, oh yeah, here's an interesting question for Helena. Um, Helena, so um, do you see any seasonality in your data on wastewater? That's interesting. And um, is it just COVID seasonality or do you also see seasonality based on, let's say tourism cycles in Miami or students coming back to campus or very interesting questions or uh, climate seasonality? That's a very wide question. It could be all sorts of answers. Yeah, in terms of seasonality, definitely when it came to students coming back on campus, we could definitely see that. So every time the students would go home and then come back, we would see the spikes coming in on, on campus. Um, that was observed at the beginning of the semester and after the first in 2021, um, Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, the students came back and we saw another spike at that time, um, which was the Omicron spike. So yeah, no, definitely, um, especially when people come to, you know, from different places come back together. In terms of seasonality, in terms of climate, you know, the 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 positivity was more drawn, more um, pushed by the variants. So you can definitely, you know, the, as the variants came through, you saw the ups and the downs, ups and the downs, and that overrode a lot of what the climate variability would be. But we do anticipate that there is climate variability. Um, you know, I think SARS-CoV-2 was more drawn by um, people coming together. So in the winter, in the northern regions, there would be more um, cases. In the south, in the summer, it would be for us because we come, we're more indoors at the summer. Um, but I think for other illnesses, such as fungal pathogens, uh, they may be more driven by environment, humidity, temperature. So I would expect that, although there is some seasonality in terms of people coming together, in terms of the SARS-CoV-2, I would think that there's true environmental seasonality as well, um, in terms of maybe some of that in SARS-CoV-2, but much more in other pathogens. Very interesting. Thank you for that very thorough answer. I learned a lot. Um, so this has really been a wonderful uh, session. And I think we're good to go. So thank you um, to our presenters, XT, Dr. Tan, uh, Helena, and everybody who joined us today. Lauren, thank you for coordinating us as always. Um, and if there's a, we hope to see you next time. We do these on a quarterly basis now. And in the meantime, feel free to go to the KIC website um, and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So good luck with your research. Everyone stay well and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.